नमस्कार दिस इज द सेकेंड लेक्चर ऑन द रोल ऑफ एनवायरमेंट एंड एनवायरमेंटल डिजाइन ऑन परफॉर्मेंस एंड हाउ द स्टडी ऑफ एनवायरमेंट एंड एनवायरमेंट डिजाइन लीड्स टू अ बेटर वर्क एनवायरमेंट दिस इन टर्न विल लीड टू बेटर इंटरेक्शन बिटवीन द ह्यूमन्स एंड द मशीन्स लीडिंग टू greater performances and higher efficiencies of workers last class we looked at some environmental factors like how do we define temperature and what are the various measures of temperature how temperature humidity and air velocity combine together to form the heat index and how heat exchange through processes of radiation convection conduction and evaporation lead to the equilibrium of heat between the human body and the environment we also looked at the effect of clothing humidity and air flow on adaptation of climatic conditions within the work work environment we looked at the process of acclimation and acclimatization and i ended that class by looking at how cognitive performances get affected by heat i explained to you how simple tasks are affected by heat exposure whereas complex tasks show little or no effect of heat exposure today's class i'll focus on how the feeling of cold affects cognitive performances as compared to what we saw how heat explains cognitive performances the feeling of cold also affects our cognitive abilities the definition of cold is different for different areas of the world but it is believed that there is a range of temperatures which can be called as cold now it is generally believed that cold temperatures do not massively affect performance but as i proceed forward i'll explain to you how cold temperatures affect manual dexterity and those job which require you to move the limb some higher order cognitive processes like planning and executive functions are almost to very low level affected by cold or the sensation of coldness and as research suggests that most of the cognitive processes are affected to very few degree due to the temperature going below a certain level and people feeling cold so exposure to cold temperatures that do not produce a hypothermia condition might increase decrease or have no impact on performances once somebody reaches this state mental performance declines rapidly the cut off point at which cold temperatures start affecting cognitive ability is the point at which hypothermia sets in during hypothermia most of the body parts become freeze and the limbs cannot move the overall body temperature goes very below the zero degree and due to this the body gets into a temporary shock because of which it cannot do most of its physical as well as cognitive tasks but below the normal body range and above the hypothermia temperature ranges can affect performances on mental tasks 
in either an increasing, a neutral or a decreasing way. Cold temperatures increases performances on complex cognitive tasks involving short term memory and logical reasoning. Degraded performance are observed on simple tasks including sustained attention and visuo motor flexibility. When researchers performed experiments with people who were exposed to different levels of temperature drop below the normal body temperature, it was found that those tasks which require higher order cognition had little or no effect. In fact, some of those higher order cognitive tasks actually led to better performances. On the other hand, simple tasks like maintaining vigilance and doing some simple motor activity, they suffered. It is quite evident why this would have happened because the limb slows down in terms of performing an action because of this lower temperature. So, although the brain can send signal to the limb to perform the action, the limb due to the temperature drop takes some time in adjusting and performing an action. Now, when assessing the performance results for all tasks combined, cold exposures tended to increase accuracy which is percentage correct while increasing reaction times and decreasing efficiency number correctly divided by the reaction time. So, when performance were assessed on a number of cognitive tasks and they were combined together, it was found that the exposure to cold temperatures increased the efficiency and accuracy of people's response. Although people were more accurate, but they were doing the job in more time than normal temperatures and that led to decreasing in the overall efficiency because overall efficiency of a task is defined by how many correct items you have performed and dividing it by the total reaction time that you have taken to complete the job. So, cold temperatures although improve the accuracy of a response, but it decreases the reaction time and the efficiency. The distraction hypothesis which says that people perform at lower levels is because they get distracted by the temperature, posits that negative effects results because individuals are distracted by the environmental condition such as when decreased skin temperatures were associated with longer response times and decreased efficiency on simple visual motor reaction time task. As the body temperature goes below a certain level, the skin starts feeling the temperature and its efficiency decreases. The movement of the limbs take longer time and because of this longer time, although at the level of the brain, the command for performing an action has been initiated, the execution of this command through the limb gets delayed. This delay is because of the lower temperature and this is what in summary the distraction hypothesis also suggests. So, up till now we have looked at how climate affects performances of people. We have looked at how heat and cold affect not only physical performances, but also cognitive performances of people. Beside climate, a number of other environmental variables also affect performances of people. Some of these variables is what we are going to investigate next. One important variable which has been researched 
a lot in both ergonomics and industrial and organization psychology is the effect of lighting. It is believed that artificial lights tends to increase performances equivalent to natural light. And so, after World War II, a lot of companies focused on ways to improve lighting. A number of researches were done to show how lighting increases performances on factory floors. So, let us look at in detail what is the effect of lighting on performance. The type of lighting we use can impact our performance and safety. If you are reading, you may need more light because if you are reading from a book, the book does not have a source of lighting. So, bulbs or incandescent lamps would produce light which gets reflected by the printed words and the background of the page and then your eyes perceive this difference between light reflected, light reflected by the words and the background of the page. Further to this, you can read. And so, when it is words on books that you are reading, you require more light. In comparison, when you are reading on a computer monitor, you would require lesser light. The computer monitor emits light and because of that, the environmental light or the extra light that you would need would be lesser. So, various types of lighting affects our performances. Let us look at how light is produced. The bulb which we all know produces light releases light and the amount of light falling on various objects is called illumination. The act of light falling on certain objects is called illumination. Now, when an object gets illuminated, it is going to absorb some of the light, but it would reflect some light which is falling on it. This reflected light from objects on which light is falling is called luminescence of the object. So, illuminated objects reflect light falling on them which is called the luminescence. So, how do we measure light? The rate at which light is emitted from a source is called the luminous flux. At what rate and what amount a light source is releasing light is measured in terms of the flux and it is measured in terms of lumen. Now, the measure of lumen is lux which defines how many lumen are distributed per 1 square meter. So, the unit for measuring lumens which is the luminous flux, the amount of light which is produced by a lighting object is measured in terms of lux as a SI unit and foot's candle per meter as the American unit of measurement. So, 1 lux is equivalent to 1 lumen per square meter or the luminous flux of 1 square meter of a bulb which has a strength of 1 lumen. Luminous intensity is the amount of luminous flux per area. So, intensity is how bright or how many lumens are there from a object which is reflecting light and that is equivalent to the luminous flux and divided by how much area is receiving that luminous flux.
It is also interesting to know that the selection of different types of light objects will lead to different types of light. When selecting a light source, two important aspects are considered. One is called the efficiency and the other is called a color rendering. So, when you think of buying a bulb or light source, two important facts that people should consider is how efficient is the bulb. If in low electric consumption, it is producing more power, it is called more efficient. An example is the CFL or complex compact fluorescent lamp. As compared to the normal bulb, the incandescent bulb, which takes in a lot of power to produce less light, the CFL uses pressurized gas to produce more light. So, those bulbs which produce more light per unit consumption of electricity are called efficient. A second factor is rendering of color. How much capacity does the light source has to exactly replicate the color of natural objects? This is called color rendering. So, efficiency is a measure of how many lumens are produced per watt of electricity. I just explained to you. And color rendering is a measure of how well the artificial light reproduces the true color of objects compared to natural light. Sometimes artificial light produce color, but these colors are not good. They do not replicate the natural color of objects. Sometimes it is too red, sometimes it is too black. So, a light source which can produce natural colors are preferred sometimes. Now, some lights can alter the color appearance of objects, which can be an important consideration in the food, apparel, clothing and medical fields. In consumer psychology, I teach about how to influence people as a shop owner and there lighting has a lot of role some kind of pricey items or aesthetic buying promotes using low level lights that can enhance your mood and would lead to more buying behavior. So, lights can be used for that purpose too. Let us look at how light is produced. Lamps which are light bulbs are sources that emit light energy efficiency and color rendering are affected by the type of lamp which is selected. Bulb produce light, but the type of bulb will tell you what is the efficiency and what is the color rendering. There are two types of light sources. One is called the incandescent lamp, typical light bulb, where you have a filament which is connected to two poles of electricity, the anode and cathode and current moves through this filament. As current moves through this filament, this filament heats up. The filament is put in a vacuum and as it heats up, it produces energy. This gives us light and this is the typical incandescent lamp. Now, incandescent lamps are frequently used to have good color rendering, but tend to be inefficient. Although the typical bulb gives you a good reproduction of natural color, but it takes more energy to give light. Now, fluorescent lamp on the other hand are most common types of gaseous discharge lamp and have good efficiency and color rendering. The CFL or the Complex, compact fluorescent lamp, they have both good efficiency and good color rendering depending on the type of CFL you are using. Now, a lamp is generally inserted into a luminaire. 
the luminaire is the object which holds the lamp provides electricity to the lamp and all those connections which bring in electricity from the wall outlet to the bulb this whole setup is called the luminaire so luminaire is a light fixture and the electrical wiring associated with it the type of luminaire influences the distribution of light and whether the light source is emitted upward or downwards if you have seen table lamps they have different shades on top of the bulb and these different shapes of the shade decide where the light will be focused so the way a shade is put on a lamp decides where the focus of light would be luminaires that shine the light downward are referred to as direct or semi direct lighting and if the light is directed upward these luminaires are considered semi indirect and indirect lighting so shape of luminaire will decide whether the lighting is direct or indirect another feature which affects performance and which is related to light is called the glare now when selecting a luminaire it is important to consider the effects of glare what is glare when some light source directly hits someone's eye it produces glare because it temporarily encapsulates the person in terms of looking at objects so glare occurs when light is shining into one's eyes producing annoyances discomfort disability or performance decrement glare is something which people try to avoid there are different types of glare we'll talk about it now when a light source such as the sun is in one's line of sight this is called a direct glare so looking at the sun directly is or looking at an incandescent bulb directly through the eye creates a direct glare we experience indirect glare when the light reflects off other surfaces such as our computer so if the light falls fast on your computer screen and creates discomfort in your eyes this is called indirect glare the amount of indirect glare will be dependent on the reflectance of various surfaces the indirect glare how much the strength of it is will depend upon how polished or rough a surface is the more polished a rough surface is the more indirect glare you would feel reflectance is measured as the difference between the luminescence and the luminance levels now as the surface that is smooth and polished reflects a direct line of light this becomes a specular glare so polished surface produce something called a specular glare an example of this is using your watch to focus the sunlight into somebody's eye and disturb that person this kind of glare is called a specular glare on the other hand you have a diffuse glare which is when light spreads in all directions and does not appear as a single point of light sometimes you see glares in such a way that it is diffuse light and you don't know from where this glare is coming those are the cases of diffuse glare we also have an experience of veiling reflections quite often you would have seen old crt computer monitors they are so polished that when you look at those monitors you will see objects which are behind you clearly on that monitor this phenomena is called veiling reflections which are often reflected images of objects on polished surface and creates a glare discomfort glare is uncomfortable but might not reduce visibility or performances disability glare decreases visibility most likely decreasing performances so glares can also be 
described and differentiated in terms of discomfort and disability. Whereas, discomfort glare will not directly reduce a lot of cognitive performances on tasks. Disability glare quickly encapsulates per people and reduces cognitive performances. Disab disability glare that is so bright that one cannot see after the glare has been removed as in the case of light beams of an oncoming car in the night is referred to as blinding glare. You would have seen this phenomena when you drive in your vehicle or a friend's vehicle, especially on Indian roads, you will see people using high flame and when they use this high light or high flame, the light of the approaching car which is coming from the headlight falls directly on the eyes of the driver. This glare is so discomforting that it creates small regions or times of no seeing which means that it for the driver becomes temporarily blind for some seconds. This kind of glare is called the blinding glare and it is advised to drivers to not use this high beam while other lights are available. High beams are only to be used on highways which have no light and when you see cars at greater distances. In near distances or in city traffic, high beams should not be used because they create blinding glares. It is important to reduce or prevent glare as glare can reduce visibility. Visibility is our ability to discern what is presented to us visually. So, glares temporarily block visibility which is our ability to distinguish what is there in the object. Contrast is another factor which affects visibility. Contrast represents the difference in the amount of light reflected by black letter on white paper on which it is printed. When the luminance levels of the surrounding area is low creating contrast performances often decreases. If surrounding area has low luminescence then the area of interest and if you create contrast this will lead to performance decrement because the eyes will have to work more in terms of adjustments. The two luminescence are very different and so the eyes has to keep, keep moving from the low to the high region of luminescence. This will create discomfort and this will lead to decrement in performances. As long as the surrounding luminescence was about the same level of the screen luminescence or greater, problems due to transient adaptation which is the eyes must continuously adjust between light and dark environment will disappear. When using computers or a computer monitor, if the level of luminescence around the monitor and your computer is same, people will not have discomfort. But imagine sitting in a dark room and typing something or working on the computer. The eyes has to quickly move from the keyboard to the computer and while it is doing that, it has to quickly adjust between dark and light regions. This phenomenon of adjustment between dark and light regions is called transient adaptation and that will create discomfort. So, it is better advised to read in well lit rooms or to work in wet, well lit environments where the eyes does not have to constantly shift between two regions of luminescence. Only with lower luminescence values in the surrounding area there was a performance decrement. Now, luminance levels could be lower for individuals younger than 40 years of age as their eyes adjust more quickly. So, young people below the 40 years of age they 
have good eye power and their adjustment of eyes to various luminescence is easier. But as you old and your age becomes above 40, you require more luminescence. So, old people are suggested to work in better lit environments for greater performances. Now, the type, type of task and the, the type of distribution of light also have, have effects on performances. Task lighting is the specific lighting required for a particular task or activity. Certain tasks require higher or lower levels of illumination. For example, when reading, it requires greater illumination than socializing. When you are with friends, you do not require too much light. But when you are reading, you require much light because the whole area that you are reading has to be properly illuminated. Now, some tasks may need shadowing to allow the observers to de detect flaws in materials, as is the case of inspection lighting. While the task involves the use of computers, amount of ambient lighting can be reduced. Now, when is shadowing important? If you drop something on the floor and try to pick it up without bending down on the floor, you will not be able to distinguish. So, if you have a needle and you drop it on the floor, watching it from the height that you have, you will not be able to find out the needle. For that, you have to bend to the floor, lie parallel to it and then you will be able to look at the shadow of the needle which is produced by the light source. This shadow of the needle will be different from other shadows which has been casting on the floor and it would be easier for you to find the needle and in those cases shadowing is important. Another aspect of lighting that should be discussed is the distribution of light or the illumination. The light distribution, the scattering of illuminations over an environment can be important as how much light is available. If we have uneven light distributions, they create a major problem for people. As people move into and then walk from lighting, they experience transient adaptation. Owing to the time it takes to dark adapt, an individual is likely to miss something while in the darker environment. If you have seen city lighting, there are different light posts and when you are near the light post, you can see better. But the regions between the light post are darker and there is very less overlap. The more distance that two light posts are, the more work your eyes has to do from adjusting to lighted sources or lighted environments to darker environments between the light, light post. So, distribution of light or, distrib or the arrangement of light post should be done in such a way that enough light is available in between light posts because if that is not the case, then people would suffer because their eyes have to go through transient adaptation adjusting between lighted and darker environments. Another environmental factor which produces better performances and sometimes harms performances or mostly harms performances is environmental noise. What is noise? It is any sound which is unrelated to the tasks. So, whatever task you are doing, any sound other than the task related sound is called the noise. It leads to hearing losses and temporary and permanent threshold shifts. Noises can lead to loss of hearing if it is very extreme and sometimes it can create temporary and permanent shifts in sound. How do people become less hearing? This is because if you are exposed to constant noise of higher frequency, this will lead to adaptation and changes in adaptation of your hearing system which will lead to increase in the threshold or increase in the hearing ability of people. The threshold shifts and hearing loss stress the importance of hearing protection. So, a number of fields can get affected with it. If you are working on a factory floor, the noise can create problems in your performance. Think about those people who work on airports. These people constantly are in touch with jet engines which produce a lot of noise and so it is 
mandatory for them to wear some kind of apparatus which protects them from this loud noise. Humans are needed for proper functioning of the airport also in regions where the jet engines are there and so proper protection against environmental noise should be provided. Let us look at what kind of protection can be provided for noises. Two types of hearing protection include the ear plug and the ear muff. Whereas the ear plugs are inserted into the ear canal which blinds you or cuts out extra noise, the ear muff covers the outer ear. For better protections, you would have noticed that people working as a ground staff on airports, they use both the ear plugs and the ear muffs. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration defines exposure limits to various sound levels to protect workers from too loud or too long of an exposure. So, even though we can protect our hearing and reduce our exposure time to loud sounds, being in noise, noisy environments can still affect us. It could be that we could protect ourselves with these ear muffs and ear plugs and keeping away from regions which have no, loud noises. But being in environments which have loud noises, for example, working in a bar or working in a railway station, these have really loud noises and that can also affect our performance. As any auditory display or sound, not just warnings, can mask other sounds, it is critical to account for potential masking when designing auditory systems to avoid potentiality debilitating performances. So, while designing auditory alarms, it should be designed in such a way that the alarm should not create problems. Rather, it should be designed in such a way that it does not mask the signal that you are monitoring. Auditory alarm should be made in such a way that it should do its job by alerting you, not create problems for you. If alarm is too loud, it will create problems and it will have the masking effect. Environmental noise can increase one's perception of workload and be distracting causing interferences with various tasks. If you are in a environment which has a lot of noise, for example, a railway station or a share market or working in a bar, the noise is quite high and there if you ask the people who are working there about their workload they tend to overrate their workload simply because of the fact that noise could be too distracting and it could be too mentally exhausting because of this people rate their work to be having higher loads or they doing more. This higher workload is because people have to concentrate more on their work and use more cognitive resources. This extra use of cognitive resources leads to higher workload or the perception of higher workload. Now, when these noises conditions occur during the learning and recall phases, performances in all conditions drop related to quiet conditions. So, students were taken in and they were given certain materials to learn and later on recall. They were exposed to several situations where different amounts of noises were given to them and the results of these experiments suggest that performances in all conditions dropped related to quiet conditions. So, when students were in a, in a loud environmental noise situation, the learning as well as recall both suffered. The fact that performance dropped over time with noise without speech present does not support the argument that phonological store was affected, but that the disruption arose due to constantly changing sounds. So, since no speech was present, only environment noise was present, it can be safely said that it is not a phenomena related to executive function 
or working memory related problems which lead to the depletion of the phonological store. What I mean is that if no sound speech is produced, the executive part of the brain or the working memory will have no extra load and neither the phonological loop will be enough busy. The decrease in performance instead happened because these noises which were coming from the environment were constantly changing which led to uneasiness and extra effort from the side of the participants who were doing the job to concentrate on remembering what has to be recalled. That created the problem and that led to performance decrements. Research finding supports the notion that sounds or noise does not have to contain understandable speech to be distracting. This is an important fact. It is often believed that people talk that leads to environmental noise and decrement in performances. Research suggests that white noises or noises without speech in the environment can also lead to distracting performances. So, constant humming sounds or constant wailing and waning sounds which have no perceptible speech can also lead to decrement in performances. It appears to be the variation in sound that is distracting. As I just explained, it is the way a sound is produced, the waxing and waning of sound waves which is actually distracting and lead to performance decrements. Now, when there are many sounds, it is harder to distinguish and notice the variation which is less distracting. But if there are too many sounds, it becomes less distracting because noticing all of them becomes a little bit difficult and so it does not cause too much mental load. Now, when listening to calming music, 10 and 11 years old students perform better on arithmetic and reading comprehension world rec recall task compared to children not listening to music. Experiments are done to find out how children respond to music and it was found that music increases arithmetic and reading comprehension. Listening to aggressive music significantly impaired performances on the reading comprehension task related to calming music and these students also reported lower levels of altruistic behavior. When the music was aggressive, this led to higher arousal levels and higher distraction and because of this higher arousal and distraction, students become more hyperactive. So, they reported more impaired performance of cognitive tasks and not only that, they also showed impaired altruistic behavior. They were less helpful than people who had calming noise. You often have people telling you to perform some kind of meditation. What meditation would do is lower the arousal levels and the brain activity and with that you will be able to concentrate and be calm. Lowering this brain activity increases your concentration which leads to performances. On the other hand, if you are listening to more distracting sounds which create more brain activity, this will increase workload and it will also affect your social behavior. Now, the design of the interior environment also has an effect on performances. Now, in addition to temperature, lighting and sound effects, the layout of a physical space is another important component of environmental design. The layout of physical space has important consequences on performances and it is an important part of environmental design. So, how you are working has a lot to be dependent on where you are working. The kind of environment that you are sitting in, the kind of environment that you are working in that is surrounding you has a lot of effect on your performance. Now, the arrangement of your environment also influences efficiency, effectiveness and safety. How your environment is designed? What kind of objects do you have on your table? Whose 
surrounds you? What kind of privacy do you have in your office? What kind of objects are there near you when you are working? And what kind of uh, environmental stimulus you see while working? All those will influence your work performance. The design of environment includes information on how specific arrangements of the environment impact individuals interaction with other people and equipment or machines within the space. So, design of environment will include the arrangement of environmental impact and interactions of people, people and people machine. To determine the appropriate layout and arrangement of spaces, one must first determine how individuals interact with a space. To understand how environments affect performances, we have to know what kind of interactions are human having with the space. To understand the interaction, a technique is used which is called link analysis. In link analysis, we look at all possible interactions the person in question is having with all those objects which is around him. By studying his interactions, a kind of a flow diagram is designed and certain rules for ergonomics are used to redesign the way people interact with themselves and other people. This is designed in such a way so that people effectively perform the actions without getting distracted. And this new form of designing the interaction of people with people and people with equipment within the workspace is called link analysis. So, link analysis is a common method for determining the movements of people within the workspace. How people move within the workspace and whom they talk to, whom they, uh, they interact with, how do they interact, which equipment which they interact, which equipment they interact with more frequently, which is the equipment which they interact with less frequently, where their positions, everything is considered. Two key components of link analysis are frequency and importance of the movements that people do within their work environment. Now, when a person must interact with certain equipments more frequently, the equipment should be positioned closer to the user. Similarly, if one of the control is critical, it should be located to the user even if the frequency of use is low. Given the fact that people interact with a lot of equipment, think about a typical office person. While he is sitting in his office chair and table, he interacts with the computer, the keyboard, the mouse and several other things which are present on his work table. Beside that, he will also have to visit the file cabinet where files are kept and also go to maybe the tap for getting water. He will also have to make movements in terms of asking queries and getting suggestions from other people working around him. So, a lot of movement has to be done. Now, those objects that a person frequently uses should be kept up front within his reach because if that is done, then unnecessary movements can be curtailed and people's performance can be increased. Here, there is also a question of using emergency buttons or using uh, emergency controls or critical controls in their use. Although the critical controls should be kept within the reach of people or should be kept very near to uh, the reach of people, they should be designed in such a way that when accidentally uh, pressed or accidentally used, it should not become active. So, some form of resistance should be provided. Now, to determine the frequency of use, observers record the frequency with which an individual interacts with the environment. Interaction includes people's movement from one station to another or the movement of an operator's hand and foot from one control to another. So, for doing link analysis, the frequency with which a person interacts with either another person, an object in the environment or a control is recorded. All movements necessary for performing a task is recorded 
and the manner in which these movements happen is also recorded. These interactions or connections are links that can be recorded on a diagram by drawing the movements each time they occur while individuals perform the task. So, a diagram is made and where the task that this person has to do is outlined and the number of movement that he is doing is also depicted in terms of links. These movements depending on how many times the person perform these movements are given weightage. So, a thicker line has more weightage which means that people are using this link more than a thinner line. Now, it is important to record the directional flow of these interactions. It is not only recording how many actions people do, but how the actions are done, which direction, is it typing from the limb to the computer or is it reading from the computer and understanding. This type of exchange of information or flow of information should also be recorded in a link analysis. So, reporting of directional flow of interactions which might impact sequential layout of various stations and equipment. The directional of use will tell where should various stations and various equipments be placed. Now, once the totals are determined, the links can be rank ordered. Once you know which link or which interaction is happening the most, a weight is assigned to it and then the importance of use can be ordered in terms of rank. This can be done using a diagram and by using this diagram and doing this kind of a rank ordering, we will come to know which are those motions which are necessary for somebody to perform and which are those actions which are not that important. So, the importance of the actions necessary to perform a task can be easily seen with a link analysis. The importance of a particular interaction can be determined by the subject matter expert. Another source of data is task analysis which captures information about how the equipment works and identifies critical processes related to the use of equipment such as relationships or links between various controls or displays on the equipment. A task analysis can be done which will tell you which are those actions that the user has to do to perform an action. Sometimes task analysis are not very productive. In those cases, subject matter experts can be called in and they can highlight and choose those actions which are necessary and without doing uh, those actions, the task cannot be completed. So, those actions which are necessary can be evaluated by using either task analysis or subject matter experts. Actions which are critical can be represented by links and relationships among rings and weights can be provided to that. Now, once the frequency and important ranks are determined, these scores can be summed to determine an overall rank. It is helpful to create a flow diagram using these data indicating the various linkages with the respective rankings. So, once we come to know what is the frequency use of a particular control and a particular action and what are the various ranks that each control and action gets, these scores can be determined and summed up to give us an overall rank of which control is important, critical and which is not. This kind of ranking will also help us making some kind of a flow diagram as to how somebody is doing something. And these data indicate the various linkages with the respective rankings. Once the link analysis or the current space is complete, it can be scaled to a cutout or a computer program to create multiple designs to determine the best layout given and these data to ensure everything will fit in the space. It is generally not possible to design the perfect layout. So, with no conflicts, people go for satisfying the best possible option in a particular situation. Link analysis can be used to determine 
the layout of a single office as in the aforementioned example or it can be expanded to include the layout of multiple offices or rooms as well as items in a larger space. So, links analysis can be done for smaller offices or for the larger offices and if not the perfect, the best way of performing a job or the best solution for performing a job can be identified. Let me try and explain this to you through an example. Suppose I am an operator who has to input data, I am a data entry operator. Now, when from the moment I sit in my chair to the moment I leave my desk for some job or the pattern of my doing the job can be captured through a link analysis. The observer will first look at what do I do when I first sit in my chair, whether I on the computer, if I do, what kind of actions do I do? Do I log into a website? If I do that, then what kind of software do I pull? So, if I pull an Excel sheet, then how do I input the data? Do I copy it from one file to another using a mouse or do I then get up from my chair, go to a cabinet, pick up a file from there, come back? How important is picking the file? How important is putting the numbers? How many times? do I do other actions like talking to a colleague and asking him some details of the data? If I do that, how many times do I do that? How many breaks do I take? What kind of motions do I do in doing this data entry job? So, and what is that, um, data entering according to me? Is it only putting the number once or is it re-verifying it again? So, all these jobs but from moving from my chair to the machine and then to talking to the friend, going to the file cabinet, talking to a colleague, asking him about the data, calling someone on the phone, getting more information on the data, uh, then watching my cell phone, getting some information from there, going to uh, maybe the tap for getting water or the coffee house for getting coffee. How many actions do I do in completing my job? All this can be rated and links created out of it. Each action that I do will have a certain weightage. A subject matter expert or a task analyst will tell me using a task analysis which of these actions are necessary and based on that a flow diagram of these actions can be created and some actions that I do for example, calling someone on the phone for getting uh, data or uh, some specificity about some data can be reduced by creating a in uh, mail chat where I can while inputting the data put that request on the chat and the other person can respond right from his terminal. So, instead of doing unnecessary actions of calling on the phone, I can get the data. So, this kind of solutions can be generated by using a link analysis. Now, there are different types of offices and they also create certain kind of performance effect. Another design factor includes open plan or cellular office. Open plan offices are those offices which are open and they have cubicles. Cellular offices are closed offices. Open plan designs imply no separators in the workplace to identify different work areas other than the individual workstation. So, it is open plan office, everybody has their own cubicle and it is open. A cellular office consists of a completely enclosed workspace with a door that closes. So, generally the chambers that people have are closed offices. Advantages of open plan office or workspace include increase in visual and auditory communication, creating a more flexible working environment, more interactive or social environment. However, flexibility and increased flow of information can reduce visual and auditory privacy. So, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. Similarly, the cellular office allows for higher level of auditory privacy, but greatly reduces the ability to communicate easily. So, on one hand, it increases privacy. On the other hand, it uh, decreases communication. It is beneficial when individuals need limited distractions and the opportunity to concentrate on a task that has high cognitive demand. So, those tasks which have high cognitive demand or uh, closed offices are or cellular offices are much better. And those tasks which are more confidential, those can also be performed in closed offices. 
Now, uh, cellular offices also create a boundary or identifiable territory where these officers might be perceived as less welcoming than an open plan or cubicle office. So, open office has its own benefit and cellular office has its own benefit. Cellular offices suffer from the idea of communication or people perceiving them as more unwelcoming. On the other hand, they have advantages of confidentiality and more concentration. Open offices enhance communication but creates a dis uh, distraction while doing confidential and uh, cognitively demanding task. Windows also have a role to play. So, performances uh, preference for windows could be confounded with the likelihood that windowed workspace are closer to the outer edge of the building and possibly in a corner further away from high traffic areas, equipment room, stairwells and air conditioning or heating system. So, windows have a uh, requirement and while using a window you have to be away from certain spaces. Now, in windowless office, the median number of decoration or pictures on the walls tended to be greater in the windowed office. It was found that windowless office has more pictures. In addition, these items were generally of a more landscape or natural decor whereas the number of cityscapes were above the same. This created a ratio of landscape to cityscape decor that was greater in windowless office than in windowed office. In the windowless office, people had more pictures of nature than uh, cityscape. If there is a person environment compatibility, the environment supports what the individual needs and wants to do and allow for reflection. If a person environment relationship is not compatible more energy or cognitive demand is needed to perform a necessary task and restoration is needed. So, those offices which have windows and which have better pictures related to nature, their performances are better. Color also affect environment. Now, the impact of environmental color is less well understood than other environmental factors due to other interacting variables such as one's personality or job demands. Now, it suggested that blue and violet colors, the high frequency end of the spectrum are calming than reds, the low frequency of the spectrum and stimulating colors. However, these colors likely interact with perceived task demands. We have looked at color in uh, the third section, which was uh, designing visual uh, signage and uh, talking about color and uh, visual adaptation. So, I will keep this discussion to minimum. So, colors and the perception of colors also affect our performances. One effect of color is the effect on mood. So, moods tend to be more positive when individuals rated the work environment as having color than either being a neutral or no color situation. Although environmental color appears to impact mood and possible performances and we can make some generic statement about these effects, more research is needed to explain and explain contradictory findings. So, color has an important uh, role to play in terms of uh, performances and this is directly related to mood. The last section that we will do today is wayfinding. We are talking about one office, but there are situations when people have to move from one office to another office and this movement from one office to another office is called wayfinding. So, the way signages are put, the way people uh, are uh, given instructions or people are given signs to help them to move from one office to another also has an effect on their performances. So, navigating among spaces or wayfinding can be greatly impacted by the environmental design including layout, space, signage and color. Wayfinding successes is related to our cognitive maps or our ability to image of the layout of a space. Let me explain what a cognitive map is. If you close your eyes and imagine your house or your room, you have a mental map or a mental picture of how your house or your room looks like. This is the cognitive map. This cognitive map has a lot of role in navigation and uh, wayfinding and this creates this map uh, is helpful in producing higher or lower levels of performances. The way this map is encoded. The use of landmarks or environmental differentiation such as different architectural styles or colors as well as signage can increase wayfinding successes and proficiencies. However, using just one of these environmental design aspects might not be sufficient. So, the way the signages are designed, the way uh, buildings are designed, the type of instruction given to people for movement, all these will affect the uh, performance of people on jobs. 
Now, as the complexity of the building design increases, people make more wrong turns, backtrack more often and travel at a slower pace. If the signage for moving from one building to another is uh, made in such a way that it is confusing, people backtrack and they have a lot of wrong turns and uh, get into a lot of uh, problem because of which performance hampers. To increase wayfinding success in complex environment, signage is most helpful. However, multiple cues is best. Although textual signage is a bit distracting, when the environment is simple, it is more helpful than a graphical sign when the design is more complex. So, graphical signs are more uh, better and then simple signs and depending on the task that you are doing and the complexity of the environment which you are, the simple sign or the complex signs can be varied. Environmental designs can be used in multiple settings to create or influence movement. In particular, environmental designs can create spaces that are easy to defend, increase ability for surveillance, detecting criminal activity with obstacles or creating more on ownership by enhancing territoriality. So, creating environments which are more conducive can uh, lead to decrease in criminal performances and increase in surveillance and it can also lead to an increase in uh, positive feelings by the employee and uh, can create a, a more effect of ownership which can lead to better moods and better performances of employees on jobs. This is what I have for you today. Thank you, goodbye and namaskar.